right, so this is really a, a, a fascinating crowd, and I think I have the easiest job um, of the whole three-day event, because this is quite an illustrious panel, and I know they all have a lot to discuss. Um, when we look at the state of the hedge fund industry since the great financial crisis, the performance has been a little lackluster, and there have been lots of conversations about uh, what's going on in the hedge fund, and, hedge fund world, and are we ever going to see the sort of uptick uh, that we saw pre-crisis? And I think the past two years has brought that question to the fore, uh, where we've seen tremendous performance, tremendous alpha, and a lot of attraction of assets. And, and to talk about the question, um, is the hedge fund industry back, is the panel, and let me introduce everybody very briefly, Stephen Cohen is the founder of Point72. He is a legendary hedge fund investor, as well as proud new owner of the New York Mets. Uh, Dimitri Balasanyi uh, runs one of the more interesting hedge funds in the world. They manage about $9 billion, returned more than 30% last year. Alana Weinstein is the founder of the IDW Group, one of the hedge fund industry's leading hedge hunters, hedge fund head hunters, and she knows all about talent and what it takes to get on top and stay on top. And at the end of our, our panel is Mike Rockefeller. He's the founder of Woodline, which was one of 2019's biggest hedge fund launches um, in less than two years, has eclipsed more than $5 billion in assets under management. And so let's start with a question for everybody. Are hedge funds back? Is the industry in a, in a better place than it was uh, before uh, the pandemic lockdown. Let's start with Steve. I mean, I don't know. Uh, have they ever left? I mean, you know, hedge funds have been around for a long time. I mean, there are ups and downs. And uh, listen, the markets obviously have been pretty good since March of last year. And, and um, um, you know, there's been a, there's been a lot of um, um, interesting, um, you know, uh, there have been SPACs and there have been, you know, new companies that have been IPO'd. And, and so there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the surface, a lot of rotations in the markets. And so lots of opportunities to create alpha. And, uh, you know, I think the performance has been good. I don't think it's been extraordinary. And so, uh, you know, usually, you know, in up markets, you know, there's an opportunity to, you know, we all tend to look okay. And... Um, you know, we'll see what it looks like when the world changes. Anyone else want to jump in? I, I do think we're in a better place, but I think part of that is because there was a real culling of the industry from 2015 to 2018. As much as we've seen these fantastic headlines tooting the, re the resurgence of hedge funds in the past year and change, there were all these headlines, if you remember, also predicting their demise back then and doomsayers about the industry. And we saw a lot of funds go out of business, big funds that once upon a time were brand name funds like Eaton Park and Blue Ridge and Convexity and Pine River and Blue Mountain. And the list is, is honestly too long to recount. These were not two bit players. These were real funds that just couldn't make it. And um, I do think where we are now is in a better place because like any industry that matures, and we are maturing, we're still young, but we're maturing, there is a weeding out of weaker players. And I think a healthier set of funds remain. And yes, COVID, like Steve suggested, the, the opportunity set was great for funds. There was a lot of volatility. Fundamentals came to the fore. Uh, great sector themes were accelerated. But there's also, also a path dependency to investing, and you can take more risk when you're up and, um, and buy at the bottom with both arms. And I think the fact that we do have now, and this is continuing to evolve, we'll see more funds go out of business and new ones thrive, um, but the fact that there is a, a stronger set of funds today, I do think has helped in lifting returns. Dimitri, what are your thoughts? What's the state of the industry today? Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's I think it's stronger. Um, I, I also agree. Like some capacity came out of the industry, which was helpful. Um, I mean, there is a little bit of cyclicality uh, to the str to the strategies. So if you look at just overall long short returns uh, in equities from 
like 16, 17, 18, they weren't that great, right? So we got a little bit of a, a bounce back from that. Same thing with macro, had a pretty slow period with very low volatility. We're getting a little bit of a bounce back from that. Um, and I think in general, hedge funds do well when there's um, some sort of significant change in the markets that then lead to uh, more durable uh, flows for some period of time, uh, which we definitely got last year. We've gotten kind of bits and pieces of that this year. Uh, so there's, you know, there's a decent amount to do. And Mike, you come from a very different perspective. Your fund launched much sooner than, much, much later than these gentlemen. You're 2019, you're West Coast based, most of us are East Coast based. How do you see the, the world of, of hedge funds today? What does it look like from, from your perspective? You know, there's no question 2019 and 2020 were strong years for, for hedge funds and, and long short uh, equity funds. Um, but I'm going to give you a headline, Barry, that, that you haven't heard. And that is for equity long short, 2021 is shaping up to be one of the worst years for the industry. And so you say, how can that be? On an absolute basis, hedge funds and equity long short are up 8%. That, that is true, but from an alpha perspective, when you look at the prime broker data from Morgan Stanley and others, alpha generated is actually down 7%. So I think it's important to see, okay, where are those returns coming from? Is it driven by the major equity markets being up double digits, S&P almost 20%? Uh, is, is there anything beyond what's going on uh, besides the beta and factors in the market? The data would suggest no. That being said, I, I'm optimistic for the industry. Those are averages, and there are funds that are generating alpha. And I think LPs are uh, as smart as ever in being able to understand what's driving returns. And so I think this will be a great year uh, when it's over uh, to see who's, who those funds actually are. So, so let's stay with that concept of alpha, and I have to ask the question, why are so few funds persistently successful? Why does it seem that alpha is so fleeting and such a small group of outlier funds have consistently come up with a process for managing a business, generating above average returns, and doing so persistently over long periods of time for, for anyone who wants to jump on that? Well, listen, I think, um, I, th I think there are a number of reasons, you know, I mean, I think, I think, um, you know, a lot of funds tend to be very focused on particular sectors and they, and sectors c go in and out of favor. Right. Um, and sometimes it's hard to generate alpha when things aren't going well in sectors. Um, and, uh, you know, in, in multi-manager platforms that, I run, Dimitri runs, you know, we can sort of move money around and, and uh, take advantage of where the action is. Um, you know, we, at Point72, you know, we're providing our portfolio managers and our analysts with tons of resources, you know, tons of new tools. And, and so, you know, our, our people have advantages as far as, you know, what they can use and, and what they're offered as opposed to a smaller fund that just doesn't have the resources that they, that they need or, you know, would want, you know, could, or could afford to, you know, compete against the bigger funds. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're very talent oriented. And so, you know, we're, we're constantly, um, you know, regenerating our talent and, and uh, always trying to hire the best and brightest. And so, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, I mean, you know, with smaller funds, you know, they lose one important person. It's hard to recreate that, that person again. So, so let's stay with the concept of talent and go to Alana, who runs a talent recruitment firm. How do you identify the best talents in the hedge fund space? How do you recruit them? And more importantly, how do you retain them once you get these people in the door? We need like a whole panel on that topic, at least. Um, you can take the next 35 minutes. I'll just <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think everyone's here more to hear what you nah, have. Nah, I'd rather hear you. So, um, if you remember nothing else, talent is everything. It is everything. And this industry is as much about human capital as it is about managing capital. 
you cannot, you can forget about alpha if you cannot attract and retain a winning team. And I think part of it is all, is, comes down to first defining what excellence is. People bandy about the term analyst and PM and head of business and founder, but they often mean different things depending on the fund that we're talking about. So I think it's useful to focus on the skill set. With an analyst, we're really looking for somebody who is fantastic at identifying and systematizing opportunities, acquiring information, looking for patterns to figure out what's important and what's not, and velocity of ideas. Um, with a PM, we're looking for more of a risk gene and somebody who can commit capital uh, and knows when to lean in and when to lean out, can be flexible, has uh, the ability to construct a portfolio with diversification, and has a sense of how to um, really pull the levers of sizing and, uh, uh, and positioning. And I think ahead of a business, depending again on what we're talking about, if it's somebody who sits at 0.72 or Baliasny at a top multi-manager, then we're talking about somebody who's almost like the coach of a all-star basketball team or maybe owner of a baseball team who um, has, a, has a group of all-star players and really understands how to bring the best out of them um, without micromanaging them too much and uh, can really press on the nexus of uh, ambition, uh, youth, and potential. And, and ultimately, once you've identified what you're after, it's, you have to provide something that the person isn't getting where they are today. And our industry, I don't think structurally, lends itself, for the most part, to evolution because most funds, most of these 12,000 funds, are small funds. There is a founder at the top who is the committer of capital, and when you get to a point, or even if they're big funds, it, it may or may not surprise you, you could be a $30 billion single manager um, uh, fund, and when you peel back the curtain, the investing team is maybe 10, is 10 individuals who matter. So if you want to move into running a business and committing capital, you have to leave, by its very nature, you have to leave and either start your own thing or go to a multi-manager, which will give you the autonomy and the tools to be successful. Um, but ultimately, this industry is about um, wanting to be treated fairly, having agency, and being empowered. And the things that lend themselves to that are a fund's approach to compensation, uh, how much autonomy people are given, and the skills that they're learning. I think in today's environment, which has become more and more complex, uh, whether it's because of Reddit and melting ice cube shorts or just the um, uh, amount of data that everyone has access to in the industry, you, you need an infrastructure that's going to help you pair great um, ideas with superior risk management. And there are only so many funds that can teach you to do that. So that's also a big selling point for why people would leave. So let me follow up that question, and it's open for everybody. If you have a, a, a repeatable process and you have a team in place that you have confidence, confidence in, do the changes in markets, like Wall Street bets and Reddit and things like that, do they make any difference, or can your team just adapt and adjust to whatever comes its way? Let, let's well, open up to anybody. I think it depends on what your, what your strategy is. Um, I think like the Reddit situation makes it tougher to run a concentrated portfolio, uh, particularly on the short side. And so if you have a, a fund with a significant amount of AUM and a small number of, uh, relatively small number of short positions, like you really have to adapt your, your strategy. Uh, for diversified platforms, I don't really think it makes much of a much of a difference. Um, you know, we have thousands and thousands of uh, short positions and you know pretty tight concentration limits, particularly on anything with high short interest. Um, but if if I could also step step back and just on your previous question of like why uh, you know there's so few firms that are persistently successful, I think in addition to resources, which I totally agree with, I, I think the the basic issue is uh, markets are pretty efficient. And the amount of alpha spread that you can make consistently on an unlevered basis is 
pretty small, right? Like a good long short team, they can make you know three, four, five percent a year, like over five years on GMV, you know, unlevered. That's pretty good, right? Like one year they might make ten, next year they might be at zero, but over time, if they're hitting four or five percent, that's pretty good, right? If you're neutralizing factors, so. If you have a fund where you got you know a couple of groups of these guys, like it's just not enough return. You really need to lever it, and in order to lever it, you need to have a lot of people. Otherwise, you have a lot of risk with a few positions or a few people getting cold. So now you're in a completely different business. Instead of just managing investments, you're managing a lot of people, and people management's not easy, right? No, oh, <laughs> people and no right? problem. Yeah. If so you have, if you have people, you have problems. It's so, pure and simple. <laughs> <laughs> so, so are you better off with, with a, a smaller startup firm where it's the manager, a small team, and their portfolio? Do, do you feel like you have an advantage, Mike, against these guys because you're not managing 1,600 employees? I think certainly uh, being smaller is, is an advantage, uh, but um, I think scale is also an advantage. And in order to uh, attract and retain the talent, uh, you, you, need, you, you do need scale. Uh, because uh, if you think about uh, what people want, and you know, there's, a lot, there's a lot written on this. There's a book by uh, Daniel Pink called Drive. And, and he, he talks about what motivates people. What, 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 what do they really want? They, they need all of the tools and resources to be the best at what they do. And that's the scale part, because you can't offer them that unless you have a, a larger firm. Uh, they want autonomy. They want, they want to be able to live and die by the decisions that, that they make. I think the multi-manager, multi-PM model lends itself to that. The last piece is kind of soft, but it's, uh, I believe in it 100%, is, is purpose. People want purpose. And you know, there's a lot of money in this industry, and you know, of course, uh, people want to make money, but we have real evidence at Woodline, and I think you know I've heard Alana speak on this as well. Money isn't the only thing. At a certain point, people want more than that. They want partnership. They want to work with great people. They they want they're willing to sacrifice short-term compensation for long-term wealth creation. And so, if you can offer that to to people, those three elements, uh, I think those are what's going to drive retention and ultimately what we were talking about, you know, sustain, sustainable returns for, for LPs. Yeah. It's really not about the number. I know you, th you and I joke about this, whether it's about the number, but it's about the approach to compensation, which I alluded to earlier. It, people want to be treated fairly. They don't want to be netted. They don't want to feel, they're fine not to get paid if they didn't perform. But if they did, they don't want their compensation going to subsidize the rest of the team that didn't do particularly well. And I think this goes back to your question before about why so few funds are persistently successful. Um, you, in recruiting talent, you can't be that transactional. And what I mean by that is, even though this is a transactional industry, right? We raise money, we charge fees, we do well, we, we succeed, we, don't, we eventually go out of business. It's very clear. When you hire people, there are always pivot points. I don't care if it's the same role. They're going to a new fund. There are nuances that they're going to have to learn, be it the nets, the, the approach to risk management, concentration, diversification. They may need to understand how to now build and hire a team if they have a more expansive remit and they need more infrastructure underneath them. Um, and you need to give people room to fail and to learn. Otherwise, you're not really collecting any ROI on all of the effort that you went through to get these great people and talent is scarce through the door in the first place. And then the flip side of that is, there does come a point where you have to pull the plug. And founders can't be afraid to do that. Because the, the number one corrupting thing at a fund is a lot of dead wood. Because then people, again, they can't get paid the way that they would want to. And at the end of the day, um, if you are continually, and again, this may come as a surprise, it may not, that $30 billion fund with a team of 10 that matters, they're not all A pluses. 
you peel back the curtain, it tends to be the same one or two people driving returns year after year. And it's fun to be the smartest guy in the room up to a point, but after a while you start questioning whether you're in the right room. So, so let's bring in the LPs into this conversation. Uh, I used to think that LPs were looking at performance and not a whole lot more than that. But you guys are confirming what I've sort of evolved into noticing, which is LPs are looking at a whole lot more than just past performance. They're, they're looking for the ability to manage a team. They're looking for process. Tell us a little bit about how you perceive what limited partners look for when they interview a, a hedge fund as a possible investment. Well, I mean, I think they're looking at the odds of persistent alpha generation, right? So in order to, just the same way that we interview a PM and try to figure out, is this person persistently going to generate alpha for us? They're looking at the overall fund asking the same question, right? So, and then that goes back to, you know, what's your edge in various areas, whether it's recruiting, you know, developing people, it's just as important as recruiting, right? Like the vast majority of RPMs, you know, they weren't super senior PMs when they started, right, with us. Um, and, you know, helping to develop them, helping to develop their analysts, you know, people look at that, they look at your risk management. It's like all the things that you evaluate to see like, okay, how kind of, like in order to get in the door, uh, your past returns have to be pretty decent, otherwise like nobody's interested. But to figure out if somebody wants to invest, like you're trying to figure out what are the odds that those returns are gonna sustain Right, and then it's evaluating all these different pieces, you know, that lead to that. Steve, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think LPs are looking for a stability returns. They're looking for they're not looking for any surprises. They want an, a, an infrastructure operations where they can depend on. You know, you're not going to find out something. You know, something wasn't uh, handled correctly or. Um, you know, something financially was was wrong as far as accounting wise or anything of, of that nature. Um, you know, they want they want sustainability. They want to they they they're thinking long term. They want to be involved in a fund not just for the next year. You know, they want to be involved in the fund for five to ten years. And you know, they want to believe that a fund has sustainability. They're developing talent. Um, they're thinking about the world not just the way it is today, but the way it is going forward, that the, the firm's adaptable. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, I'm always thinking about new businesses, new ideas, and, and you know, the world's constantly changing, right? So what worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. And if I, I'm an LP, I want to hear that. I want to hear that somebody is engaged, thinking about the world, thinking about where it's going. Mike, you don't have the same track record, uh, length of track record, that some of the other funds have. How do you deal with LPs and what they're looking for uh, as a relatively new fund? Is there any advantage to having uh, uh, been around a little less? Well, I think there's certainly a, an advantage uh, to be able uh, to learn from uh, Dimitri and Steve and, and uh, my partner, Carl Craker, and I came from Citadel. So, you know, we, we see what it, what it takes to actually create a business. And um, it was interesting, you know, before we actually launched Woodline, Carl and I, and we, we went out and interviewed uh, a lot of uh, top fund managers and LPs and asked, okay, what do we need? What do we need to do first? And the, the answer was you know, somewhat surprising. It was go and hire yourself a rock star chief operating officer. And so you know, we went out and did that and uh, you know, couldn't have gotten anyone better uh, than Matt Hooker. Um, but why is that? Well, it's to Steve's point, these are businesses. And you know, Carl and myself and our, and our team, we know about investing, but we don't know how to run a business. And the complexities in today's world of managing a hedge fund, you know, are, are pretty immense. You know, between the technology, the risk management, legal, compliance, cybersecurity is a, is a big issue. Y you need a fully built out operations team uh, to ensure that this business is going to be sustainable for a long period of time. And, and how did you deal with that during the pandemic and lockdown and work from home? I think that caught a lot of places um, unprepared. What was your experience like? Well, fortunately, you know, a, a lot of our systems were cloud-based, 
So, so 10 years ago would have been a, a, a different story. Uh, but, uh, you know, we had, uh, we, because we were a newer launch, we already had a lot of the systems in place and uh, were able to transition to work from home, uh, you know, like a lot of funds that, you know, um, thrive through, through the pandemic. You know, people underestimate the transition from analyst to PM to head of business to founder. And what Mike is talking about in terms of having to, they think they're just going to kind of like go out, hopefully raise money, and the other stuff will fall into place because they have capital. There's so much complexity that goes into running a business. We have a guy in play now as a candidate who um, is at almost $2 billion, and he raised it relatively quickly in, during COVID in the last you know, two years. And the reason he's a candidate is because his operating team, his non-business team is a disaster. And he basically, ha and he's spending so much time on non-investing issues. And he either has to sort of restructure his whole fund or what he's learning is about himself, he doesn't want that headache, he'd rather sit someplace that's going to give him resources and give him capital. He's not gonna have to also, you have, it's not like you raise it and you're done, you're constantly out there speaking to LPs. He doesn't really enjoy that aspect of it. Um, and I, I do think that, that people underestimate how difficult that is, not even just raising the money, but actually manning the ship. Um, on, on the point of new funds, it, it, uh, Mike, ra you know, Mike launched with, what, two billion, two and a half billion, something like that. That's so unusual. And I think it speaks to, you ask what do LPs want. For a new fund, what's really important to them is the DNA of where the person's coming from. So it's you being you, it's the success you had at Citadel, and it's the fact that you came from Citadel. And, the, the, um, and that's a bet that LPs are willing to make. There's more predictive success, a, de a higher degree rather, of predictive success around Mike than somebody who comes from a fund that's you know, kind of had a meh track record. Um, and the idea that this person's going to do something different than the fund did is, um, you know, that's like, that's more of a, that's, that's a bigger risk to take. I had my team pull the, um, the biggest launches in the last two years, right? So defined as, let's call it a billion or greater, or got to a billion quickly. And almost, and there's only about, for all the hundreds of funds that have, quote, launched, there are only about 10 to 12 in that category for each year. And almost every single one of them came from either a top multi-manager, or a fund with great pedigree like Viking. Viking alone has had five launches, including this year, in the last, in the last 24 months. Wow. So, so is there an inherent tension with a firm like Viking between um, scalability and persistence of returns? Are, are people launching because at a certain point you begin to top out? What, what's well, the listen, tension? You know, listen, you hire great people and there's going to be a percentage of people that are eventually going to want to be me. Or be, you know, Mike worked for Ken and he wanted to go out on his own. Right? I worked for somebody at some point and I went out on my own. And if, you know, if someone's got a bug to do that, you can't stop it. Okay? They have to go out and do it. Now, they may succeed, they may fail. And so when someone comes, you know, my firm, they want to start their own firm, I say thank you. You know, thanks for, you know, let, you know, relationships don't have to end. They, they can evolve and change. Um, but, you know, if someone's got a bug to start their own firm, there's nothing you can do about it. If you smell yeah. someone has yeah. got a foot out the door, but you yeah. think they're talented, do you want to stake them? Do you want to push them out and say, hey, let's continue this relationship, but well, it's a go case, out on your own? It's case by case. Um, you know, one of the problems with staking people outside your firm is, you really can't control what they do outside your firm. And sometimes they start doing things and you, you, they start drifting. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's possible I might do it and it's possible I won't. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. We, I want to shift gears a little bit because uh, time is tight. We, we mentioned work from home and all you have to do is pick up the Wall Street Journal. Goldman Sachs wants people back in the office. Jamie Dimon is pounding the table uh, to have people back in the office. But there's a sense of a hybrid model yeah. as being a little more flexible and a little more attractive to very top talent. What, what are your thoughts on this space? 
Uh, is everyone going to end up back in the office, or are we going to end up with some different model? I mean, my view is I'm open to a hybrid model. Um, I mean, I, I like working at home. I mean, I, I, I actually like it. I don't feel I have to be in the office five days a week. I can run my firm from wherever I am. I mean, Dimitri, you were in Jackson Hole. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like in Chicago, like thinking um, how many PMs we had in the office there. I think we have like three or four PMs in Chicago, you know, pre-COVID. Like most of our PMs are in, you know, New York and London. And so everybody's spread out anyway. So, uh, you know, we got like 10 offices around the world. So wherever you are, like you're seeing, you know, some portion of your people, but it's usually a small portion anyhow. Um, so yeah, we're, we're definitely doing hybrid. Um, I think, uh, you know, the uh, sort of pillars uh, that we're trying to go to there, like one is you, you have to be with your team, you know, some percentage of the time on a regular basis, right? Like that's going to vary team to team, but it can't be like, oh, you know, we never see each other and it's going to be great, right? So you have, to get, you have to get together on a regular basis, whether that's in the office, out of the office, some combination of the two. Um, and outside of your team, you have to like show up once in, a, once in a while, even if it works well with your team, you have to show up in the office on a regular basis, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, two days a week or four days a week, that depends on the person. But you need that to, to just have some connectivity with people who you're not gonna just normally talk to. Uh, Cause you know, you're not gonna talk to the, the guy, if, you know, you're trading healthcare and the guy's trading industrials, you're not necessarily gonna talk to him, but you run into him in the office and it might be a very interesting conversation that leads to a thought you know, you wouldn't have had, right? But, Dimitri, the reality is we have offices all yeah, and you do exactly. too, everywhere. Like, okay, I'm in New York right. twice a, um, a month. Right. I mean, I have hundreds of people there right. that exactly. I don't see anyway, and they don't see me. Yeah. So, you really, what you got to do is you got to set up communication, and there's so many different ways to com communicate today, yeah. you know, Zoom or, you know, IM or, you know, chats or whatever the case right. may be that, you can be very effective in communicating, and it feels like you're there, and, but you're not there. So, Wait, you yep. know, it works. You know, like that was the big These surprise guys. of work from home, that we all thought it would be like, what would be like being out of the office, yeah. you know, uh, the amount of time we were out of the office, and it, the big surprise and the big learning was we can do this regardless of where we are. Yeah. I mean, this has been like a huge experiment. Let's all work from home for a year and see what happens. And in fact, the industry has had some of its best returns, long, short, equity, alpha, notwithstanding. Well, it's this also year. a bull market, too. Yeah, it was a bull that market, helps. but it was also a market for which we had never had a playbook. We'd never experienced COVID. You know, we never experienced anything like this before. I don't think Steve and Dimitri necessarily need to be an, in the office 24 7, but I do think it is important for analysts in particular um, to be close to their PMs. They can't be trained otherwise as effectively. You need this for collaboration, you need this for creativity, you need this for esprit de corps. I will tell you, and maybe I shouldn't say this, but I'll say it, in some ways, my job has become a lot easier in the last couple of years. But you're charging the same amount. <laughs> <laughs> and you're still getting great candidates. <laughs> Um, so what I mean by that is people have a step back perspective. They're, they can say to themselves, if they were sort of on the fence of should I leave or shouldn't I, um, now they're working from home. They can more clearly see what their value add is versus other people who are maybe just benefiting from being in the room with other smart people. And the stickiness to some extent, I think gets eroded when you're just not there. I'm all for flexibility, but I think as a founder, you do want your people there enough of the time where, you know, People have good days, they have bad days, but if they're there, there's sort of this almost psychological smoothing effect I think goes on. They just sort of get used to it. It's for better or worse, the devil known, and they start risk waiting all the things that could go wrong if they left versus staying put. I call it economic, you know, it's economic loss aversion theory at play with, with, with talent. Um, but when you're working remotely, that's not as much of a barrier to entry. And I think, and this year we have had, which I've never had before, People that we have gone after for years calling us, telling us they're ready to leave. Mm. And maybe it's coincidence, but I'm not sure. What, what about the flip side of this? From the employee side, 
hey, it's convenient, I don't have to leave my house two, three days a week. What about what Jamie Dimon talks about with building a corporate culture, making sure all the members of the team are pulling in the same direction? How challenging is it to manage when everybody is in far-flung locations? Well, you definitely yeah, got to work at it, but I think you had to work at it before. Like, to Steve's point, like, if you got offices all over the place anyway, you have the same problem. Right, like how do you get connectivity with your guys yeah, in I Europe mean, or Asia? Ja Jamie's sitting in New York. He's got offices everywhere. Right. He's got the same issue. Okay. Yeah. So the real prop, the the real issue is how do you communicate in a way with? He's got million. He's got a million people work for him. We have a thousand or whatever, fifteen hundred or whatever the case may be. Um, you know, they're still the same issues. How do you? How, how can you be effective as a leader? Uh, communicating what you need to communicate um, across your platform, and can you get your message across in an effective way? And I think you can, you know, and I think it has to be some combination. Listen, people want to be together. They want to feel like they're part of the firm. And, 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 you know, that's why I think a few days a week makes sense. Listen, people want to be in five days. They can be in five days. I'm not right. saying they, they can't be in five days. Um, but I do think we have to be flexible. And if people want to do it differently, and as long as they're doing what they're supposed to do, and they're you know, being part of the firm and communicating, and um, you know, why, I'm OK with that. You know? like, yeah, I think I'm it's flexible. Also, it's also a, a bit of a recruiting advantage if you can give people flexibility, right? Like it's a competitive talent market out there. So like our two fastest growing offices are in Austin and Miami. Yeah, you, you, know? you can't not be flexible. It's just yeah. the stigma of saying I want to work from home on a Friday or a Monday I don't think exists anymore, and wanting to work in other cities is something that founders have absolutely accommodated. But, you know, the issue, this is not really a work from home issue, the issue of developing and managing people. It's not just about being in the same office. I don't think this industry as a whole, we have a bigger issue, which is this industry as a whole does not do a great job of it. No, speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> there are exceptions to, <clears throat> pardon me, every rule, but as a general rule. Um, the uh, hedge fund managers are great investors. They're not great managers of people. And I think that day in and day out, um, PMs are drinking from, or founders are drinking from a fire hose of information. They're making a ton of risk decisions simultaneously. They may be overseeing hundreds of positions, and you layer on top of that having to motivate, empower, and engage your people, it's really, it's tough. But we as an industry have to get better at this because an the analysts are coming and telling us that their um, founders and PMs are giving them minimal attention, and they have to pitch and pound the table to get their ideas in, the in a book, in the portfolio. And they don't have a lot of clarity as to why some ideas make it and some don't. And so it really speaks to needing to drive mentorship and learning because young people have more options, certainly than when I was coming out of business school, right? The two portholes were really investment banking and consulting and maybe also private equity. Now there's VC, there's, you could join a fintech company, you can trade crypto, you can go to outer space. I mean, literally, the sky's the limit. And so if we want to do a better job of getting the brain trust coming out of school into our industry, we have to get better at this. And I've seen the numbers coming out of HBS to hedge funds, and they are going down. So let me stay with you, Alana, on, on a question that you and I have talked about. Um, in general, the financial industry, speaking broadly, has had difficulty recruiting women and people of color. And as bad as the, the finance industry is, hedge funds lag even that, when you're talking about being a broad manager, how, how can the industry address that? Well, first off, this isn't just hedge funds. I mean, this has been pervasive. When I pre-starting my firm, which was 18 years ago, I was in finance, finance, I was an analyst at a bank, I went to business school when it was barely 30% women, um, I worked in consulting, I, you know, I did a whole bunch of things, and I absolutely dealt with my share of uh, sexism, misogyny, and bad behavior. 
And I am thrilled that when my son goes into the workforce and your daughters go into the workforce, that kind of overt, um, th those bad actors, there's going to be a zero tolerance for, right? That's, that, is a, that is a big change from when I was just sort of cutting my teeth. Vis-a-vis, mm -hmm. um, -vis, but you know, we're still a young industry and it has to start at the bottom. We are do there's never been more heightened awareness. Seeders and allocators are deploying to women and minority owned funds. LPs are um, surveying their managers as to the diversity, leadership, and ownership of their workforce. And heads of talent are being mandated to really focus on recruiting more women and minorities. But at the end of the day, these guys have to have a robust class of diversity candidates to pull from, from the ranks of Goldman and JP Morgan and you know, fill in the blank bank so that those people can then be trained properly and develop at one of the hedge funds that matter. And I say it that way because to our previous discussion, so few funds really control the AUM in this industry. It's not just about joining a hedge fund. It's about joining a winning fund and being trained properly and having a chance to be one of these guys yeah. you know, eventually. Um, but we're, we're still early on. You know, you look at where medical school is now, it's over 50% women. Law school's over 50% women. I just saw Wharton's class is now 52% women. So it's going to take time. Um, yeah. From the beginning, let me just say one, one more thing. From the beginning of when I started my firm, I have always had founders um, stress the importance of bringing more diversity candidates to the table and, you know, asking can you, could, if there's any way for the successful candidate to please be a person of color or a woman. It's just we don't have where to pull from. So that's what I, when I talk about coming, you know, through the ranks and, and evolving, by the time we get involved, which is at a very senior level, we need a deep bench. But the important, the, another important point is I do, it's about a desire for um, racial and gender equality, but it's also a desire from our, the founders we work with for um, uh, diversity of background and thought. Because having everybody think the same, having everyone grew up in Virginia, went to Princeton and UVA is a surefire way to um, uh, drive down returns. You want divergence in terms of points of view. So we're down to our very last question, the last few moments we have, and I'm gonna ask everybody this, and I wanna open this, we'll start with Mike. All of you run successful businesses. What's been the biggest surprise running your firm? I'll, I'll keep it uh, quick here. N there's no question, it's the compounding effect of great teams and, and what you can do with lots of great people working together. Dimitri? I think this, the scale that you need to be successful, like if somebody, you know, even not 20 years ago when we started, but even 10 years ago would have told me we'd have, you know, a thousand people to, to run, you know, $12 billion, I'd be like, that's a lot, <laughs> right? But that's kind of what you need these days. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, uh, Lana, you want to go? Just how much I've learned from these guys. I really didn't anticipate how, um, energize how, how much we would develop because of all of the information that we get from dealing with the best founders and the best people in this business. We're just so much smarter for it. Steve? I mean, it's, it's a people business and you just have to treat people really well. You have to care about them. If you don't care about them or you treat them like just somebody just gonna plug in and uh, they're, they're gonna pick up on that and they're, they're not gonna be happy. Well, Mike, Dimitri, Alana, Steve, thank you so much for an informative panel. Let's hear it for our panelists.